Hi, my name is Kayer Shaw. I'm a heart failure cardiologist at Virginia Commonwealth University who specializes in heart failure. I am going to speak to you today about cardiac amyloidosis, specifically cardiac clues that would suggest a diagnosis of transthyretin amyloidosis. Transthyretin amyloidosis, or TTR amyloidosis, is a disease of protein misfolding, where the transthyretin protein, which is synthesized in the liver as a tetramer consisting of four identical monomers, disassociates, misfolds, forms fibrils, and these fibrils form this, these clumps of amyloid deposits which can go to different organs to cause damage and destruction. Hereditary TTR amyloidosis is a type of TTR amyloidosis that arises because of a genetic mutation in the TTR protein, which leads to instability, dissociation, and amyloid formation. Clinically, patients who have hereditary TTR amyloidosis can which can arise from over 140 different mutations, develop symptoms depending on the mutation at different ages involving different organ systems. The presentations are typically involving the cardiac muscle and or uh, neuropathies that both can be autonomic and sensory motor. When amyloid affects the heart, as you so I'm showing you here on the left is a pathological cross-section of someone's heart tissue. You can see the left ventricle here and the right ventricle on this side. The heart tissue is very thickened and you may or may not be able to appreciate this pale substance in the subendocardium, which is the amyloid deposition that's le leading to the thickening of the heart muscle. On microscopic analysis, what you see here is healthy pink myocytes being disrupted by this pink amorphous material that deposits itself within organs, leads to cellular disruption, fibrosis, and organ dysfunction. Now, coming back to hereditary amyloid, in the United States, the most prevalent mutation is the V142I mutation that predominantly affects Black Americans, specifically, this mutation came over from West Africa during the slave trade, whereas now one in about 20 Black Americans are gene carriers. Doesn't necessarily mean they'll develop disease, but they're certainly at increased risk. That being said, this previously rare disease is a lot more common than initially thought. Now, back to the general classifications of ATTR amyloidosis. Um, not a rare disease. Now there's two flavors. I've already mentioned there's a hereditary type, but there's also an acquired type, which um, develops with aging. It used to be called senile amyloidosis, but it's been renamed wild type or unmutated TTR amyloidosis. Of the hereditary types, I've mentioned to you already, the V122I, also renamed the V142I mutation, is very common, especially in Black Americans. The wild type is very common. It's in any population over the age of 70, where in fact, on autopsy studies of patients who died of apparently healthy causes, one in four have some amyloid deposition in their heart. The other mutations, which can present as cardiac or neuropathic presentations, are not as common in the United States and are endemic to different populations around the world with different prevalences in their respective countries and regions. So going back to amyloid and when it affects the heart, understanding how it affects the heart explains some of the clinical manifestations you'll see in clinic or that should raise concern to evaluate a patient for this diagnosis. Because the heart muscle is infiltrated with this tissue that's non-contractile, 
it leads to a thickening and stiffening of the heart muscle. Patients start developing symptoms of heart failure. They're often misdiagnosed as having PEF, PEF or hypertensive heart disease or diabetic heart disease or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Early on, they have some diastolic dysfunction. Later, the heart becomes so stiff with small chamber sizes and enlarged atria, they start developing what's called a restrictive morphology or become a restrictive cardiomyopathy. The amyloid not only disrupts muscle function, it will deposit and disrupt conduction in the heart, often leading to heart block and pacemaker dependence. Patients, because of stretching of the atria and amyloid deposition there in the upper chambers, often have atrial fibrillation or other atrial arrhythmias. The, the amyloid uh, deposits can also affect the valves and the pericardium. There is a higher prevalence of aortic stenosis because of amyloid deposition in patients with amyloidosis. In the clinical setting, one should suspect amyloidosis in anyone that has a thickened heart who presents with heart failure, where the ejection fraction is normal. Usually, the more common types of amyloid that I've highlighted occur later in life, sixth, seventh, or eighth decade. Patients may mimic symptoms of heart attacks and have chest pain. They may not tolerate usual heart failure medications because of low blood pressure. And they will report fatigue and edema that doesn't respond very well to medications and is out of proportion to what the cardiac dysfunction appears to be on imaging. Patients with hereditary variants may also report a family history of heart failure. There are some other symptoms on here that are outside of the heart that will be discussed by my colleague in a later presentation. On exam, when patients do present with heart failure, um, amyloid patients will typically have elevated neck veins due to the stiff right ventricle and right heart failure. They may have a Kussmaul sign where the venous pressure in the veins increases on inspiration. They'll have edema from congestion. Again, as I mentioned, may have low blood pressure and also some with severe disease could present with ascites and appear to be, uh, appear similarly as one would with liver failure. Amyloid patients also tend to have elevated biomarkers. Uh, B-type natriuretic peptide, either BNP or amino terminal pro-BNP are often elevated. It's a screening tool for cardiac disease and heart failure, and they're followed for prognosis in amyloid patients. Troponin concentrations in the blood, which are typically elevated in the set, setting of a myocardial infarction or myocarditis, can chronically be elevated in severe amyloid patients. And these patients don't have any coronary disease. It's simply because of myocyte destruction. Both of these markers are used clinically for serial follow-up to assess treatment response and prognosis. As you can see on this echocardiogram, there are many clues, as I'm gonna highlight, on echocardiography that should lead one to suspect amyloidosis. This is a patient with TTR wild type amyloid who has, I'm pointing at the left ventricle here, who has a very thickened septum, very thickened left ventricular free wall, thickened right ventricular wall. And you can't appreciate on this echocardiogram, but the left atrium is also very dilated. These are some of the classic findings of amyloidosis. So a thickened heart wall, usually normal ejection fraction, um, and some of the clinical clues we established earlier. So whenever you're treating someone with heart failure and you see wall thickness greater than 1.4 centimeters, amyloidosis should be on your differential. Today, with modern echocardiographic techniques, there are additional tools that can distinguish amyloid from other thick heart cardiomyopathies. I'm not gonna go through this imaging, but 
on the ECHO reports, when you order this test, they may report that they have longitudinal strain patterns typical for amyloidosis or a cherry on top pattern where you see intense red or good motion at the apex while the wall motion is less intensely red or slower away from the apex. This is called relative apical sparing and it's unique to amyloid heart disease. What is readily available are electrocardiograms. And when you have a patient with amyloidosis, you may also have findings on the EKG as a result of the protein infiltration. Sometimes the voltage is dampened. And this is because the amyloid is displacing the viable myocardium, which creates your electrocardiogram deflections. Also, sometimes there's something called a pseudo infarction pattern where one might see Q waves on your electrocardiogram which typically indicate that a patient's had a previous heart attack there, but in the setting of amyloid may occur where patients have transmural or whole wall amyloid deposition, mimicking a heart attack, but a, a MI or heart attack is not the cause of the Q wave. And also, as I mentioned before, patients often have conduction disease and many have atrial fibrillation and arrhythmia arising from the upper chambers. Newer tools have become more specific and diagnostic in helping us find amyloidosis and distinguish them from other causes of heart failure. These images here are from a cardiac MRI, again, showing a patient with a very thick heart. The dark tissue is the heart muscle. The white inside is blood. These are the upper chambers and the lower chambers. This is the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber. This is a view and cross section. Here's your left ventricle, very thick and a crowded um, small cavity inside for blood to fill. This patient's heart is very stiff, very thick, non-compliant, and the patient has significant heart failure. Again, these are some of the clues on cardiac imaging and cardiac testing that we've just reviewed and are here in table form. Ultimately though, once you suspect amyloidosis from some of this testing and some of these clinical clues, you have to pursue a definitive diagnosis. For TTR amyloidosis, in the past, we had to resolve to biopsy of the heart, which is an invasive procedure, but definitive. And this was the image I showed you earlier of healthy tissue with pink amyloid deposits between these pink, uh, between this, the collection of heart muscle cells. So these pink deposits that just look um, basically like a cement was poured between the cells are what's going on in this slide. You may have in textbooks read of Congo red staining that's, um, that can be very specific as, uh, for amyloid deposition. So this is an example of a patient with light chain. It's a different type of amyloid, but it all looks similar on biopsy. Light chain amyloid deposits in heart tissue and in a cell, in a vessel in the heart. And what you see here is the pink is the amyloid deposition. And then when you look at this under polarized light, you'll see what's called the apple green birefringence. This sort of apple green color that lights up in the amyloid is distinct to this deposition in this protein. And this is what you read about in many of the textbooks, but practically with modern um, pathology and other stains, there are now more specific stains, but I think people like to ask this question, especially as a test question. So fortunately, not everyone has to get an endomyocardial biopsy anymore. You don't have to get a heart biopsy to figure out you have amyloidosis. There are newer um, imaging techniques that have tracers uh, such as technetium pyrophosphate. These are bone avid tracers that you can inject into a patient and those with amyloid in the heart tend to bind these tracers and you can take uh, uh, pictures um, in, in 
uh, with nuclear medicine tracers and and basically X-ray to see uh, if if the heart is binding these tracers. So if you look at these examples of four different patients, you see someone who doesn't have amyloidosis. The, the heart does not bind anything here after tracer injection. And you come all the way to the other end and you see intense uptake where the heart is in the chest, indicating um, severe TTR deposition and a very positive uh, um, technetium scan for a patient with amyloidosis. So this is a, uh, a bone scintigraphy. And in the United States, we use primarily technetium pyrophosphate to diagnose TTR amyloidosis without needing to perform an endomyocardial biopsy. So I'll pause here before I hand over the presentation to uh, my colleague and highlight some of the key points. First of all, TTR cardiomyopathy is not such a rare disease, especially wild type TTR amyloidosis or the V142I hereditary variant of TTR cardiac amyloidosis prevalent in the United States, and we should be cognizant of some of the clues that should prompt us to evaluate. TTR amyloid is especially prevalent as we age. The hereditary variants that I described to you affect predominantly Black Americans and is highly prevalent in the ambulatory Black population, where almost 1 in 20 patients may be a gene mutation carrier. Doesn't mean you're going to develop disease, but it increases the risk. Cardiac clues include thickening of the heart wall and also symptoms from heart failure, arrhythmias, or valve disease. And then of course, to really be, uh, to, to really be cognizant of what's going on, one must be familiar with all of the extra cardiac clues. And I'll pass this on to my colleague, Sarah Patchouli.